Thank you for joining us for Sermons on Demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. We provide these videos as a way to share the pulpit messages and teachings offered at Friendship Grace Brethren Church. If you find these videos a helpful resource, please drop us a note at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com. Now open your Bibles and get ready to dig into the Word of God. Called to Freedom. One of, the, one of the greatest difficulties I have in writing messages is figuring out a title. Uh, for me, the title needs to encapsulate what is being taught in that section, and uh, that's always a struggle for me to, to, I know you think this is hard to believe, but to put it on, that hurt, didn't it? That hurt, yeah, boy. Sorry about that. <laughs> To encapsulate what, what God is saying in just a couple, three words is very difficult for me. I'm pretty verbose sometimes, and you know I could make a paragraph out of a title. So I, uh, I'm struggling to, uh, to, to, to get this. But in this passage, it was pretty simple. Because this paragraph, Paul starts out with the idea that we're called to freedom. And so I thought that, that it was perfect the way Paul begins... Remember last week we ended the last, or the, the first major section of the book, all the way from chapter 1, verse 6, all the way through chapter 5, verse 12. And this morning we're beginning the last section of the book. It's much shorter, and this is a real short paragraph. So when, when Pastor Matt let me know that he couldn't, couldn't do it, I said, great, you get to do 11 verses next week, because it's a large paragraph. And see, I was kind of frustrated that I was going to have to do a large paragraph, because I get in trouble for going too long anyway, and if you've got to do 11 verses, it's going to take some time. So now I only have three verses, and that's pretty cool, but we'll see how that works next week. This last section of the book is all about freedom and liberty. Christian liberty is one of those pesky topics that keeps creeping into, into churches that cause lots of, lots of problems. We as sinners have a tendency to take a little bit of freedom and extend it out to a lot of freedom, to abuse it. You know that old adage, you know, give an inch, take a mile? That's, that's us as sinful people. And that was exactly the situation in the churches in Galatia, in the churches in Rome, the churches all over. The new churches all experienced the same kind of, of growing pains. A little bit of liberty, and it gets overblown. So Paul begins to discuss that this morning. Paul had spent a great deal of time in the previous section telling the Galatians, look, you're no longer a slave to the law. You're no longer a slave to sin. You've been freed. We've been called to freedom. But that's not a license to sin. You know, Paul even once asked, if I can demonstrate grace because I've sinned, should I sin more so the grace is more uh, visible? Of course, the answer to that question was absolutely not. But that was the mentality. That's our mentality today. If a little's good, a lot's got to be a lot better. You know, we see that as people self-medicate. Well, little works, a lot works a lot better. And so we end up with those kinds of, of issues. The churches had to deal with the same issues that we have to deal with. Our society may be different, but the issues are the same. Legalism or the, the inverse of legalism, and that's liberalism. Somewhere there's got to be a happy medium of what God has prescribed for us. One of, the, one of the big issues facing the church is not so much in the early days, not so much an issue for us today because we don't have a lot of meat markets where you could buy meat that was offered to idols. I haven't asked Mario's, you know, we get our, most of our meat there. I haven't asked them if, if it's cheaper there because it's been offered to idols, but I just don't think there's a lot of that going on. But remember how the situation was in the Greco-Roman world. They had all these gods, and they had to offer lots of sacrifices to them. And so they would take the meat offered at, at sacrifice, 
and they'd sell it at a reduced rate. I mean, after all, it sat around for a while with the flies and the stuff around it. And so you got it cheaper. It was still basically pretty good meat, but it had already been offered to idols. And the Christians, some Christians had a problem with that. Well, that's not really good for the church to be eating meat that was offered to Zeus. And other Christians said, it's, Zeus is not really real. It doesn't make any difference. And it's cheaper. Shouldn't I conserve my money so that I can go out and minister more with the money? So you can see the conflict. That was a real conflict in the early church. Some people had liberty and some people didn't. Some people were compelled, no, I can't ever, I can't ever be involved in anything having to do with Zeus and the other gods. And the others were, shouldn't I save my money? And so we had this conflict going on. We have a conflict that's kind of the same in the church today, dealing with alcohol. Some churches say, absolutely not. You cannot consume alcohol. After all, Jesus made made grape juice into wine, but it didn't have alcohol in it. It was super grape juice. No, that's not true. Paul tells Timothy, drink a little wine because it's good for your stomach. Everybody drank wine, even kids. Why? Because the water would kill you. It had bugs in it. And... The wine killed the bugs. The the alcohol killed the bugs, or some of the bugs. We probably couldn't drink their water either then, but you understand the deal. We have churches that say you can't touch alcohol, and other churches that have, have no real hard and fast rule on that. Churches that allow smoking, churches that don't allow smoking. Not because God said anything about it, I can't find a passage in Scripture that talks about that. I can find is well, that's not really true. I can find a passage that says, light up your camel. <laughs> but that's not what he was talking about. <laughs> tattoos recently have become one of those issues. You know, tattoos are a big deal nowadays. I'm not really sure why, but a lot of people are really intrigued by painting their body up with this permanent ink. And so we have a conflict. Some churches teach that's absolutely sinful to do that. I can't find a place in Scripture that tells us that, tells us that. Now, the Jews, the Hebrews, the Israelites, they were forbidden to to get a tattoo because it was a symbol of slavery. That's not the case for us. That's one of those... Those rules for the Levant that doesn't apply to us, no matter how you look at it. But there are churches that teach if you've got a tattoo, you're in bad shape. Now, I don't personally want one, but that doesn't mean that that's a rule that God has established. It's like pierced ears. You know how ears, what what pierced ears were a symbol for in Israel for the Israelites, that they were owned by someone else, that they were a slave. That is not what it means today. So when Reese went and got her ears pierced for the third time? I mean, let's get it right this time, okay? It wasn't a symbol that she was owned by anybody other than her mom and dad right now. That's not what what, what pierced ears mean. But there are people that teach those things. And so we still have the same kinds of conflict, maybe with different items than the early church did. That's what this discussion of liberty is all about. Taking what we're allowed to do and making it something else. Creating rules that don't apply or just obliterating the rules and doing whatever you want because if a little sin is is permissible under grace, then a lot of sin is permissible and we just demonstrate how much greater God is. That's kind of warped logic, but that's the way it works for a lot of people. So let's, let's dig into these verses and see what the Apostle Paul tells us this week. For you are called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. I love how Paul juxtaposes the sides here. How he says, here's freedom and here's legalism. Don't abuse it. You are called to freedom. I love that. There's so much theology there. Now, we 
have to remember what Paul said in the verse previous to this. Where we ended last week. In order to really understand, because we're in a separate paragraph, but the paragraph builds on the paragraph from, that we looked at last week. So look what he says. I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. Remember what we, what we said last week. I'll come back to that in just a minute. For you were called to freedom, brothers. I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Paul's declaration that we were, that we were called to freedom follows immediately on that statement, I wish those who give you problems would emasculate themselves. I wish they would jump in full bore and go and commit themselves totally. Remember what we discovered last week, that following the, the, the goddess Sibeli, that men would have to emasculate themselves, which meant they became non-persons. Under Roman law, they no longer could inherit their family wealth. They no longer could enter into a lawsuit. They no longer could have any legal standing. So Paul is saying, I wish they would jump in full bore, commit everything for their future to their religious pursuit. And then he follows that up immediately with, for you are called to freedom. Not to the slavery that Sibeli required, not to the slavery of becoming a non-person, we were called to freedom. How liberating is that? Called to freedom by God. Harsh words he gave in verse 12. Nice comforting words in verse 13. Called is a unique word here in the original text. The root of the word is the same word from which we get ecclesia, the church. Ecclesia means called out ones. We were called out. And Paul uses that same word here. We were separated by God for a specific purpose, for a specific function. God separated us from the rest of the flock. You uh, have seen cattle drives on, on TV and stuff, and, and as they, they get near to, to the town where they're driving the cows, they, they then separate them into, into how they get sold. That's the process. Going through and separating out the ones that God has chosen. What a special privilege we have because we've been called out by God. Before the very foundation of the world, God decided how he was going to do that. And he did that. Called out is, in our modern verbiage, we would probably better use the word summoned. Probably received jury summonses. Some of you, like Pastor Matt, get speeding tickets. And when, when, the, when the officer gives you the ticket... He says, press hard five copies because they go to the court and one stays with you and it says that you have to pay or appear before such and such date. It is a legally binding summons. You don't show up, what happens? Guys in green come knock on your door and say, come with me. Indiana had a great term for that. It was a writ of body attachment. It was, a, it was beautiful because a judge signed a body attachment and then we would go arrest somebody and put, attach them to jail until the judge was ready to see them. If you really angered the judge, it'd be a while. We attach their body to jail. It's a summons. That is the same word here. Not only have we been separated, we've been summoned. A legally binding contract that God has placed on our lives. And God didn't have to say, press hard five copies. He made it such that it was legally binding just by his very word. We've been compelled. We don't have time this morning to go through all the theology of what that means. It is a great study to understand what God means when he says, I have summoned you, I have compelled you. 
You are mine. By the way, I decided this before I created, so there's nothing you can do about it. We believe, as the Apostle Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, before the foundation of the world, God chose us and predestined us to be adopted to His sons. Adopted children of God. We are adopted into the greatest family in the history of the universe. We will spend eternity as children of the King. That's what God said. You were called to freedom. You were summoned to be my child. Being sons and daughter of God the Father means that we have freedom. Not slaves to sin, not slaves to the law, freedom. What a blessed that blessed thing that is. But there are boundaries. We're not free to do just whatever we want. There are boundaries on what we can do. Look at the last half of this verse. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Look at the comparison and the contrast there. Opportunity for the flesh is one way freedom can go. The other way freedom can go is to serve one another. He said, I have called you to serve one another. Not to do whatever feels good to you. Not to do whatever makes you feel best and gives you the greatest. That's not God's mindset. Unlike what a certain preacher in in, uh, Houston says, God's not happiest when He makes you happy. God's happiest when we serve Him and when we love Him and when we worship Him. One of the greatest problems with freedom is the abuse of freedom. A little bit takes a lot. In our our natural sinful state, we just naturally take advantage of freedom. I'm guessing that you parents have never taught your kids how to circumvent the rules. I'm guessing that's not high on our priority list of what we teach our kids. They figure that out all on their own. And some of them are pretty sneaky about it. They're pretty good at it. They're smarter than we are sometimes, and they can get over the line before we even know where the line is. As we uh, worked our way through First and Second Corinthians, we saw that the Greco-Roman world was heavily influenced by Greek and Roman gods. They were very polytheistic. They had many gods that they worshipped. Many gods were worshipped in The worship often involved drugs and alcohol. It involved sexual acts. That was a heavy component of the the Greco-Roman worship system. Temples were built that included many side rooms where the priestesses of the various gods could entertain the men worshiping. Today we call that the no-tell motel. But it's the same thing. But that was heavy in the system. It was an accepted form of worship. And we know that as we studied 1 and 2 Corinthians, we saw how that infiltrated the Corinthian church. How Paul had to deal with that. The Romans even had four kinds of marriage so they could legally take care of of the prostitute situation besides the worship situation. They had marriage by the hour. When I was in the vice unit, we called that a dime for time and quarter for two. But that's the same thing. Let's make it legal. What is it in in Nevada, the bunny ranch? They've made it legal. Didn't make it moral. They just made it legal. They took those freedoms. Now imagine how those legal things then infiltrate the church. We know it was a real problem in Corinth. I'm certain it was a problem for the, for the Galatian churches as well because of what we saw last week in the other gods that were worshipped in the area. Those kinds of freedoms were infiltrating in the church, causing all sorts of problems for them. 
Paul's instructions here is that we were called by God to freedom. But that doesn't mean we can continue our deviant lifestyle from before we were saved. Or, in the case of the Corinthians, even after they were saved. Because it was part of their culture. Paul's instructions here is, says, look, you are called to freedom, but not so you can live like you want, but so you can serve one another. God doesn't save us and then turn us loose to do whatever we want to do. He leaves us with some standards. The standard of His character. He still has requirements. Look at the last phrase of verse 13. But through love, serve one another. Through love, serve one another. What a picture that is. Go on to verse 14. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. What Paul means here by the whole law is fulfilled in one word is kind of difficult to determine. I think perhaps the best way to view whole law is specifically the law of Moses as an expression of God's will. I've, I've said this in other words many times. The law was not just do's and don'ts given by God to, through Moses to Israel. The law was how you live with each other, how you relate to each other in the camp, how you relate to the neighbor in the next camp over, how you relate to the other nations, most importantly, how you relate to God. The law was the expression of God's will for how they live. And so for Paul here, the whole law is fulfilled in one word. How do you relate to the world? You relate to the world, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, unless you have some serious psychology going on in your brain, you kind of like yourself. Most of us are pretty egotistical. We're going to take care of ourselves before we take care of anybody else. That's the way we're wired. And our Western culture mandates that now. And so if you love yourself, that should be the, the, the standard for how you treat everybody else. Just like you treat yourself. If you're the one that deserves the best, this standard here is that best goes to them. Love yourself like you would love, or love the others like you would love yourself. Put them ahead of you, is what Paul is saying here. You want to get to the bottom of what the law actually is? You want to get to the bottom of this phrase, love your neighbor as yourself? That's not something new with, you, with the Apostle Paul. Moses wrote it in Leviticus 19.18, You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Look what he says next. Why? I am the Lord. I set the standard. Love your neighbor as yourself. I have set the standard. But Jesus says it all uh, as well. Honor your father and your mother. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. I threw that one in today for Mother's Day. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. Now, Jesus has elevated the standard here. Just as I have loved you. Now, he said this before he went to the cross, fully knowing he was going to the cross. So what's the standard of love that we're to have for each other? We've got to be willing to die for each other. That's a high standard. You know, that's the standard that Secret Service agents take, willing to take a bullet for the president. Maybe some are not so willing right now, but... The standard is we have to be able to love one another to the level, to the character, to the nature of who Jesus is. He gave his life. And you see, that sacrifice is so much bigger than just giving his life. Because he fractured the triune unity. He fractured that for a period of time. Something that had never happened before there was even time happened while he hung on the cross. 
He made himself part of time and space for eternity when he became a baby. He sacrificed greatly, not just the physical pain of the cross. Paul wasn't the first ones to say these words. He just, he just said what Moses and Jesus had already said. We in the modern church often think that for the Israelites, it was all about keeping the law. We have this false understanding that for the Israelites wandering in the wilderness and then making conquest and settling in the promised land, that it was all about keeping the law for them. From the very beginning, it was all about loving one another. It was about how to live right. That's what God was teaching them, how to live right. Moses writes in Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 13, And if you will indeed obey my, obey my commandments that I command you today, to love the Lord your God and to serve Him with all your heart and with all your soul. It never was about keeping the law. It was about loving God just like it is for us. It's always been more than the ritual of the law. It's always been about our love and service of God. So Paul here in Galatians 5.14 reminds the Galatians that they're called to serve God, to express His will. God's will for us is that we love one another. Now sometimes that's hard. Because let me let you in on a little secret. We're not all lovable. Some of us are not lovable at all. Some Christians are just downright nasty. And they're hard to love. But imagine where Jesus stood in this. He gave up so much and loved us even when we were still His enemy. I want you to go to Erbil, Iraq this morning in your mind where they just executed a bunch of Christians where one of our soldiers was one of our Navy SEALs was killed this past week and I want you to I want you in your mind to stroll into the ISIS headquarters in Erbil and I want you to find the leader of the of the ISIS brigade that is stationed there the ruthless guy that has personally killed hundreds of Christians. And in your mind, I want you to walk up to him and hug him and says, I love you. Jesus died for you. That's hard for us to do. And that's nothing compared to what Jesus did for us. We were his enemy. And he demonstrated love by becoming a dirty diapered baby, living through his life and ultimately hanging on the cross, fracturing the unity of the Trinity. So that we could be saved. He loved us that much. And then he said, you love one another. He gave us the standard. Now look what happens when we don't follow that standard. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. What's the end result of church fights? Splits, problems, anger. In juxtaposition with loving your neighbor, it's twice I got it in, by the way. In juxtaposition of loving your neighbor as yourself, we bite, biting and devouring one another. That's the, that's the flip side. We either love one another or we attack one another. God called us to the freedom of loving one another. It's very common in churches today and in the early church to have fights among members. Linda and I were members of a church when one Sunday morning, somebody, and I don't remember who it was, stood up in the service and said, if you follow the pastor, if you support the pastor, stand on this side. If you support this side, stand over there. We stood up and left. We saw what was going on there. There was a fight going on in the church for power and control. We saw that happen in many churches the last time there was a split within the fellowship. As people argued over a very fine theological point. It went from discussing this theological point to ad hominem attacks on others. Others. 
Well, you're big, ugly, and stupid. You don't know what you're talking about. Rather than, let's talk about what God said in His Word. Men that I looked up to, men that I had studied under, all of a sudden attacking each other. I was very early in my ministry when the last split happened. And I was very impressionable. And I watched this as our fellowship struggled over the issue. My point is that the modern church is not immune from the work of Satan. The work of Satan to disrupt the church, to destroy the church. He wants to destroy the church that is serving him, serving God. He doesn't care about the churches that aren't. I can pretty much guarantee you that at the basketball arena in Houston this morning, Satan could care less. He's loving it because they're not preaching the gospel. God gave us freedom from the oppression of slavery. Slavery to the law, slavery to sin. He gave us freedom from that. He called us, He summoned us to be free from that slavery. We demonstrate that slavery through the fulfilling of the law. Demonstrating His character. Demonstrating His will. That we love one another as we love ourselves. Love for the other, which is greater than love for ourselves. We protect ourselves. We provide for ourselves. And God says, the level you do that, do that for your others, for the others around you. Moses, Jesus, and Paul are expressing here is that we don't put our, ourselves in a place to receive, but to give. To give that love and that protection to others. When we get embroiled in fights and attacks of others, we're placing ourselves above the others. We're thinking only of our internal desires. We're thinking only of what affects us. We're thinking of what we want and not thinking of what God wants. As Paul says in verse 15, the end result of attacking each other is that we are consumed by one another. The meaning of the Greek word translated as consumed here in the ESV is so much fuller than consumed. It has the sense of destroy or completely use up. When we attack each other, what do we do to the church? We completely destroy it and use it up so that it has no ability to minister to love as Jesus loves us. Remember the context of this section. It's the freedom we have been given by God. The principle behind that freedom is love. It's always love. The character of God demonstrated by our freedom is love. Love for God, love for each other. And when we place ourselves above someone else, when we seek our best and not their best, we're not loving. But remember, this isn't the end of the discussion. This paragraph's not the end of the discussion concerning liberty and freedom. Not everyone has the same conscience concerning freedom and liberty. Eating meat offered to idols was a perfect illustration for the early church. It didn't bother some and it bothered others. Having a beer after you mow the lawn is a problem for some and for others it's not. Putting a tattoo on your body is a trouble for some but not for others. And that results in fights and we can't do that. We should only fight about what God has said. We need to stand dogmatically on what God has said and what He hasn't said makes it only our opinion and that is valued at very little. God's opinion is what matters. When we practice love, then we recognize the level of freedom and liberty that the others around us have. When I love you, I'm conscious of what is your trigger. I need to know you well enough to know that if I brought a beer and set it up here on the podium, it would offend some of you. 
I need to be mindful of those things. I need to be mindful of what causes you to stumble and never put anything in your way that causes you to stumble because I'm supposed to love you. And in loving you, I'm supposed to know you. And I'm supposed to treat you better than I treat myself. We are to give up our liberty in order to love one another, to provide for your conscience. Paul continues on this same vein. In the next paragraph, it's a long one that, Lord willing, Pastor Matt stays healthy this week and he can tackle. I'm pretty much of the opinion right now, even if he's, unless he's in intensive care, he's got got 11 verses to do. In those verses, the Apostle Paul builds on what we saw this week as he discusses walking in the Spirit. You see... I don't have the capacity to love you as Jesus loves. That's not in my nature. My nature is all about me. You know, Toby Keith sang a great song. I'm not going to sing it because that gets you in trouble around here. But I want to talk about me. I want to talk about I. Number one, me, my. That's who we are. See, he's not singing something that wasn't real. He's singing absolutely the truth. It's all about us. And so how do we get to the point where we can love like Jesus? By walking in the Spirit. That's a tease for next week. Father, thank you that you have called us to freedom. Father, I admit I wouldn't be a great slave. But I was a pretty good slave to sin and to myself. And so I am thankful that you called me to freedom. That you have given us the example of love in your love for us in the sacrifice of your Son, and Jesus' love for us in the sacrifice He gave us on the cross. And so, Father, my desire is to be a good example of love, to love you, to love others around me, and to put them ahead of me, to sacrifice myself for them. I think that's the message you've, you're giving us from your Word that we're to be focused on you and on them and not on ourselves. Thank you for this great body of believers that love you and that are reaching out and that are working to raise children to love you, that are working to reach out in our communities to bring people to know you. Thank you for all that you're doing. We love you and we want to serve you in Jesus' name. Thank you for watching or listening to this teaching on demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church please consider sending us an email at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com to let us know how this teaching may have helped you. Please also consider joining us in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church, located at 10251 Metro Parkway, Suite 116, Fort Myers, Florida, just south of the intersection of Metro and Colonial Boulevard. Sunday school begins at 9 and worship service at 10 a.m. We look forward to seeing you in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church.